Father, that is our prayer today. God, you know us far better than we know ourselves. God, you have uh, given us gifts and talents and all kinds of wonderful things, uh, just being alive and knowing, God, that you are with us. But God, the truth of the matter is we do need you. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, that today every one of us, each person here, might open his or her heart open to you, to hear a fresh word from you. Because, Father, the truth of the matter is we all need you. So come and join us. God, you're already here, but we just want to verbally um, acknowledge your presence and invite you not only into this place, but into our hearts. God bless our speaker as he comes to share. May your name be glorified in all that is said and done. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a real honor for me today to stand before you and introduce our speaker today. For 33 years, longer than some of you are alive, um, Dr. Vondi Cook has served as lead pastor of what is now Cross Point Church in Beckley, West Virginia. Yes, good things do come from West Virginia. <laughs> Under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the church, it's the church that he's pastored, has experienced near miraculous growth in spite of being located in poverty-stricken Appalachia. Dr. Cook has a passion for God and a heart which beats to let others know about him. He's a lifelong learner. He holds two bachelor's degrees from Warner University, a master's degree from Liberty University, and a PhD in organizational management and leadership. So in addition, he's a very busy man. In addition to pastoring and a growing congregation, Dr. Cook is a consultant with organizations seeking polity and structural change. And he's also an adjunct member of the New River Community College faculty. He's married to his wife, Lori, who's here today. And uh, here's a couple who loves the Lord and loves serving him. Together with their five children and three grandchildren, they enjoy being outdoors, even in the rain, even in the rain. They enjoy being outdoors to include kayaking and jet skiing and playing golf and just being outdoors and loving the outdoors. It's an, it's an honor, and we're humbled to have uh, Dr. Cook come and share with us. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Vondi Cook? It is my honor to be able to come and share with you. I do not feel worthy to stand behind this pulpit where my heroes in the faith have stood and have shared time and time again. But my task today is to talk to you about hope and to talk to you about eternal life. And so I would like to ask you some questions as we get started today. What do you trust? In a culture like ours, what do you trust? In what do you trust today? And I ask this because I believe what we trust really defines and declares what, where our hope lies and where our hope of, of what we expect will reside in us. However, when it comes to the term hope, I believe that there is a great paradox with the term hope. Hope is very fragile, but it is almost indestructible. I want to say that again. Hope is very fragile, but it is almost indestructible. And you may ask me, Vondi, what, what, did, what does that mean? It means hope is very fragile, but it is almost indestructible. Because when people lose hope, negative consequences always follow. When the hope that we strive for, that with which we trust, when all of those things go away from us, 
all of a sudden our lives take on a totally different direction than what we expect. Let me give you an example. There was a lady by the name of Bertha Alley. I know none of you know Bertha Alley. But it was my privilege to get to meet her when I was 14 years old. And Bertha Alley was a lady who was an avid reader. She loved her Bible and she loved, and I'll, I'll give you the age for some of you in the room today, Grace Livingston Hill books. And she was one that read those just incessantly. And one of the statements that she made many years ago now, she said, if I get to the place that I cannot read, I don't want to live anymore. Because she placed her hope and her trust in the ability to see and to be able to read and to learn and to grow. And at 94 years young, Bertha Alley's vision went away. And for the first time in my young life, I was able to see a person who literally was healthy for a 94-year-old, extremely healthy. But as the old timers used to say in our part of the world, she took to her bed and she turned her face to the wall. Three days later, Bertha Alley stepped into eternity because she had made a choice, because the hope that she had trusted in being able to see was gone. Let me give you another name that you probably have never heard before. His name is Cecil Darby. Cecil was a, a man in his early 60s who was required to take early retirement because from the hospital where he worked because of diabetes. Cecil was a man who had not taken care of himself earlier in life with diabetes. He just would take more medicine if he wanted ice cream. Yet he had to retire early because of his heart and because of his kidneys. And he had to go on dialysis and over time the ravages of what he had done to his own body and just the ravages of diabetes. He lost a foot. I was with him when we were at Duke University when they told him he was not a kidney transplant recipient because of what diabetes had done to his body. And as we were driving back from Duke to Beckley, West Virginia, he said, I received a death sentence today, didn't I? And I said, yeah, buddy, you did. Now what will you do with it? Well, he was a fellow who decided, I, I can't get a new kidney, I can't get what I, I desired and looked for. So he said, what will I do with this? And I said, well, Cecil, you've been forced to retire. Why don't you re-enlist in God's army and see what he has for you? And from a wheelchair, a few years later, a man who lost a foot, then they had to take some more of his leg, and then some more of that leg. He built a ministry to our shut-ins. We call them unforgettables. And he built a ministry from that place because he did not allow that circumstance to take the hope away from him. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, which has been your theme verse for the entire semester, I was told, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that there's some things in that verse that we can unpack today that I hope you will indulge me in in just the next few minutes. I believe one thing that we find in all of this when it comes to discussing hope in eternal life and hope in all of the ways that we live and, and where we move and have our being is God's unshakable love. God's unshakable love. It constantly reminds us of his enduring affection, his enduring care, all the things that he would call each and every one of us to. And this love is unlike the love that many of us have experienced, a love that is fickle in our human relationships, conditional, and in many cases fleeting. God's love is always steadfast. It is always unchanging. And yes, it is eternal. And it is a love that is not based on our performance. I know that we are a holiness group. I understand our history and those things. But the love of God is not based on how good a guy I am. Thank God. And all God's people said. Yet, my worthiness and my ability to reciprocate does not, it does not affect God's love for me. 
Romans 8, 38 and 39, Paul said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because I know that, it does not give me a license to go out and live like I want to. It does not give me a license to go and do what I maybe would want to do in a fallen world. Yet it gives me an understanding that in the midst of life, in the midst of trials, tribulations, challenges, finals, and all of the things that we face, that our God walks with us and our God talks with us and our God moves and demonstrates his love for us. Even back in Psalm 130 verse 4 it says, but with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. To think about what that means in my life, to, to understand that God's unshakable love is not something passive, but it is something very active. It is something that speaks to me. It is an active force that compels me and draws me and he acts on my behalf. And as I process through that, it is almost so much bigger than, than my finite mind can understand. Even that familiar verse of John 3, 16, which many of us memorized when we were young, and depending on what era you grew up in depends on the translation that you grew up with. I'm old. I grew up with the King James, that one that Jesus spoke. <laughs> and we all know that. Yet for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or for the young ones in the room that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see the ultimate act of love, that unshakable love that God offered to me and he offers to you is not about words. It's not just about feelings. It's about actions. And it's the actions that he was willing to do and share and sacrifice for you and for me. You've heard it over and over again, I'm sure. But had you been the only person that ever would have needed eternal life, Jesus Christ still would have died for you. And if you ever doubt your value, if you ever doubt what God created in you, in a culture of doubt right now, if you ever doubt that, read that verse. Understand what it means. Understand Jesus' model for us because you see, it's in that moment that there is a power found in hope. There is a power that is found for each of us. And, and while it is a challenge, it is not something that is based on, on fleeting, baseless optimism. But it is a firm assurance in who God is and what he can do for us. It is a hope that is not just wishful thinking. It's not just a positive attitude. And all of those things are important, yet it is a confident expectation in God in who he is and what he will do for us for you, for me, for all those that will ask. Because you see, hope is very fragile, but it is almost indestructible. Paul highlights that for us. Paul brings that to, to account for us when he prays for believers that they may experience a power and a hope of the Holy Spirit of God that is greater than them. And it is not a hope that comes from circumstances, but it is a hope that is coming from God himself in the midst of all of that. I appreciate what Dave said about me when he introduced me earlier. I sound way better than I am, Dave, in that introduction. And my wife can attest to that for me today. Yet, I know in the midst of trial and circumstance, in the midst of God's blessing, in the midst of, uh, of the things that, that he has offered in my life, and, and I'm sure in yours at some point, at some place, that you can see him step in. I remember when we were getting ready to relocate, a church that purchased property in 1932. In 2010, we were going from 
uh, less than 10,000 square foot facility to over 30,000 square feet, from a $300,000 piece of property to a $4 million piece of property. And we were in the midst of all of that. And, and for those of you that don't know, in Appalachia, it takes a little bit to get the ground ready to build, unlike Indiana. You're flat. You can go out and build, and it's not nearly as expensive when you have to knock down a mountain, fill in a valley, and then be able to build. It costs a little bit more. Even though we're on a plateau, that's what we had to do. And I'll never forget walking over that area with the then chairman of the board, and we were looking at, at what was going on and all that God was, was doing in our midst. And he made a statement to me, and, and looking back on it, I, I understand because I have the luxury of looking back, but at that moment I didn't fully understand his statement. He said, Vondi, are you ready to lose all the people you're going to lose when you relocate the church to this new place? And I just looked at him for a moment. And it was at that time that the Holy Spirit of God spoke into my heart and gave me words that are far above my own. When I called him by name, and I said, I said to him, disobedience is not an option. When God was bringing us to a particular place, disobedience was not an option. When the church had decided way back in 1962, long before I was thought of, not to relocate to a place on Harper Road in Beckley, West Virginia, 40 years to the year, God gave us land on Harper Road. And there was one person left who was in leadership in 1962, who when we had our family meeting, she said, it was the biggest mistake we ever made, Pastor, and I say we go. Yet when this particular individual said, Vondi, are you ready for all the people you're going to lose? I never thought it would be he and his family. But it was. And in the midst of all of that, I could experience the power of God and get to the place to where I could understand exactly what it was and how that impacts who we are and the hope that we have because, ladies and gentlemen, hope is very fragile, but it is almost indestructible. And it's that transformative understanding. It's that transformative way that hope changes our perspective. It enables us to face trials. It enables us to go through tribulation with courage and perseverance. It gives us strength for the moment when we do not possess that in and of ourselves. Our God comes along and says, this is what I can do if you will walk with me. And that impacts my attitude. That impacts my actions. That impacts where I stand and the place where my motivation finds that inner working that I need to not only trust God in those moments, but to recognize that He calls us to live lives of holiness and goodness and godliness, looking forward to the day where what we do helps to speed His return and His coming. But you see, hope, is trusting in God's idea. It's trusting in what He would have for me, and that's not an easy task. It requires faith, it requires patience, and it requires at times a complete and total surrendering of my desires and my expectations. And that is a lifelong experience. It means acknowledging that we do not have control over many things in our lives that we actually believe we do. The older that I get, the less I realize I ever have had control. And that's when I have to submit my will and my life to an authority that is so much higher than mine, an authority that is at work beyond who I am, an authority that I can trust. And that's, dis that's difficult to grasp at times. It's difficult for me to hold on to in a society that values our independence, our self-sufficiency, in a movement 
that desires our own self-sufficiency at times when we have to step back and say, Lord, what is it that you have for me? What is it that you desire for me? That's why Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, as we read earlier today. In all your ways, this translation says, Submit to Him. Not just acknowledge Him, but to submit to Him. And He will make your paths straight. You see, that reminds me that my way is limited, but His is not. The way that I look at life and the way that I see from my small vantage point. Yes, Beckley is 2,500 feet above sea level, but it's only a small part of the world that God has allowed me to see. I can't see the panorama of everything that's out there. I can't see all of the things that, that God lays out there for me, but by trusting in Him, by trusting in Him, then I allow Him to guide me and to direct me. And knowing that His path is always the right path. Lori and I live just a few miles from Grandview National Park, the newest national park and preserve in the United States. We have a guest room. Come on and you can tour. All right. Yet, the main overlook, you can see the New River Gorge and the New River for seven miles. It's a beautiful view up that valley. But the best view is not the main one. The best view is a place called Turkey Spur. Google it, you'll find it, okay? It's called Turkey Spur. And you walk up on a, a rock outcropping on the edge of the New River Gorge. And when you're there, you can see the New River as it flows underneath. But it goes down and it creates a horseshoe around a mountain and you can see the river on the other side of the mountain as well. That's how God looks at us. That's the view that he has. He can see what's on the other side of the mountain. He can see what's on the other side of the field. He can see what's on the other side, and I can't. That's why Jesus' model of trusting God's plan, even when he didn't want to, even when he knew the hurt, the heartache, the pain of what the cross was going to be, that ultimate surrender of him to understand what eternal life would cost him that he could see what it would bring to us and what he brought to us was something even greater than our words can ever begin to discuss or comprehend so why does all this matter why does all of this matter because in the midst of all of that it brings me peace in the midst of all of that, it takes a heart that can be torn apart by sin and absolutely devastated by the things that the enemy brings to us. It can bring peace and it can bring wholeness and it can bring health and it can bring everything that I need. Jesus shows us that by what he brings to us. That's why Paul said in the peace of God, transcends all understanding. And we quote the first part of that verse a lot. But the rest of that verse says, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We can talk about the first part and it's beautiful and it's wonderful in that verse, my friends. It is a peace that transcends and it passes all understanding. But it guards our heart. It helps us see our God. It helps move us beyond ourselves. It allows me to let go of my desires and my hopes and my thoughts. And it is a peace that comes from knowing that my God can take something that I view that is absolutely out of control and He can take all those things and work them for my good in ways I can't see 
You see, my friends, hope is very fragile, but it is almost indestructible. And now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm letting you out early. Go in peace and the power of the Holy Spirit knowing, knowing that you are loved and cherished by Almighty God. May God bless you today. Amen.